Welcome to Lease Accelerator and RGP's webinar on GASB 87. Hello, my name is Joni Knoll. I'm the SVP of RGP. I will be the moderator for today's session. The reason this was branded RGP Healthcare is because healthcare was the first group within RGP to see clients with GASB needs due to the state academic medical centers, and several universities have AMCs. We will be sharing the expertise we gain through helping over 300 companies comply with the lease accounting standards. Before we get started, I wanted to quickly go over a few housekeeping items. The webinar today is eligible for one CPE credit. In order to receive credit, you must answer at least three of the interactive polling questions that will be randomly presented during the webinar. There will also be an evaluation survey that you will find in the top right corner of the console and can submit at the end of the webinar. One of the questions will ask if you wish to redeem the webinar for CPE credit. Please check yes if that applies to you and submit the survey. After our panel discussion, we will have Q&A session. Please enter your questions throughout the course of the webinar in the Q&A box anytime in the ON24 panel in the lower right side on your console. We will answer as many questions as possible as time permits at the end of our discussion. If we don't get to your question, then we will send a follow-up answer to you. We are recording this webinar today. A link to the replay and the slides will be sent via email to all attendees within two to three business days. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, we have technical support experts standing by to help you. Please email us at webinars at leaseaccelerator.com if you need assistance. So today's agenda, we're going to go over six areas, principles of new GASB 87 lease accounting rules, policy decisions required to adopt the new standards, key decisions critical data required to start your implementation, common implementation pitfalls, budget plan and staff to achieve day one compliance, and considerations for ensuring day two and beyond compliance. Today, our panelist is Dennis Carey and Tim Tickle. Dennis Carey is with Lease Accelerator. He is a solutions consultant at Lease Accelerator. Dennis Carey helps companies and organizations navigate the challenges associated with the changes in lease accounting standards, delivering effective solutions to these varied organizations. Dennis brings a great deal of experience in treasury, finance, and accounting from his previous positions as VP and assistant treasurer at Hasbro and in managing lease accounting for over 150 owned and leased locations for Shaw Supermarkets. Dennis holds a BS in accounting from the University of Southern Maine and has earned his Chartered Financial Analyst designation. And Tim Tickle is a Director of Technical Advisory and Project Services. He has extensive background and expertise in technical accounting, shared services, mergers and acquisitions, and general regulatory compliance. He has 20 years of experience within public account fair industry. He has led a number of technical accounting engagements in connection with ASC 606, Revenue Recognition, ASC 842, IFRS 16, and GASB 87, Lease Accounting Standards. Tim has extensive experience de developing global finance processes, standing up shared services organizations, transitioning shared services to global business services, and leading global transformative initiatives across many industry sectors. So we're going to start with the principles of GASB 87 lease accounting rules. So the first question, what is the scope of GASB 87? Dennis, can you answer that, please? Sure. Thanks, uh, Johnny, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, so GASB 87 is for leases, and a lease is defined in the, in, the, in the standard as a contract that conveys control over another asset for a period of time. So conveying a control means the right to obtain the present service capacity of that asset and the right to determine the nature and manner of uses. And so it's conveying control over an asset and for a period of time. That period of time does not have to be contiguous. It just has to be a specified period of time in the contract. Thank you. Are the key differences from prior lease accounting? 
Thanks, Joni. And again, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I think when you look at the GASB 87 standard in, in conjunction with some of the other lease standards, that being AC 842 and IFR 16, there are some key differences. First and foremost, with GASB 87, they are uh, going to a more singular approach towards the presentation of leases and the financial statements on the balance sheet. Uh, under previous standards, they had a designation between capital and operating leases, and under the new GASB lease accounting, there is but one category, and that is finance. Uh, additional rule uh, changes are around the, the presentation of uh, the transition period. So uh, with the ASC 842, there was some re uh, relief provided by the FASB in uh, whether or not you had to provide full comparative financial statements under the, the new standard. Unfortunately, with GASB 87, the changes with this require that all of the financial statements presented be uh, converted to the new standard. So it does require full retrospective application. So uh, there are a number of other smaller, but I think those are the key areas of differences to keep in mind when looking at GASB 87. Thank you. And Dennis, what periods are impacted by this new standard? Yeah, thanks, Joni. So it, it's coming up soon. Um, this starts for any organization with a fiscal year that begins after December 15th of 2019, so in about seven weeks. We anticipate the first organizations will be those that have a calendar year end, so they'll be affected January 1st. And then many universities will either have a June 30 year end or possibly a September 30 year end. So you have a bit more time. It'll be sometime in the middle or late next year. Now, an important thing to understand also is that the standard requires you to start as of that date, but also when you're doing your annual financial statements, you have to apply this retrospectively by restating your financial statements for all prior periods presented. So if you do statements that have the current year and two prior years, you will also need to, in those financial statements, restate those prior periods. Thank you. And Tim, when do I need to begin reporting under this new standard? Thanks, Joni. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people look towards that first audit period by which that, that you know, an external auditor is going to be looking for these new balances on the balance sheet and all of your accounting rules. But I think it's important to understand that, you know, because we are going to a balance sheet level of approach to accounting for leases, journal entries are being booked on a daily basis as it relates to activity within the leasing portfolio. So um, while your external uh, reporting would be a kind of during your first year end audit, uh, it's important to understand that your actual transactions in the booking of those journal entries uh, occur on day one. Uh, and as Dennis alluded to, when you add in the added complexity of being able to, you know, retrospectively apply this standard to prior periods, then there's a, a significant impact as it relates to being able to prepare the comparative financial statements under the new standard too. So not looking, I, I guess the key here would be not to look at that first audit year end as your period of reporting, but more importantly, looking at that transition date as the period by which these new journal entries are going to have to be booked on a daily basis going forward. Okay, so now we're gonna go over the key takeaways in each area. So I'm gonna start with Dennis. Sure, I think some of the, the high level takeaways, first of all, virtually all of your leases will be on the balance sheet. That's going to invite more scrutiny by both your internal and external auditors, and it'll require more work, as Tim mentioned. There will be new disclosure requirements. You'll have a number of requirements to report, essentially the information that's on your statement of net position and results of operations that are affected by the impact of your leasing program. As I mentioned before, it's effective starting as early as December 15th, year end for most, mid-year or late late next year for, for those that have different fiscal years. And again, applied retro retroactively. So if you typically present two years or three years in your financial statements, you're gonna have to go back and, and apply it retroactively to those periods as well. Thank you, Dennis. And Tim, what are your key takeaways? Well, I think um, as it relates to determining what's potentially in scope for the new standard, I think 
some of the areas of that, that may be uh, challenging to organizations are around the identification of the actual term of the lease. Uh, the, the standard is very clear in, uh, in outlining that the term of a particular lease is defined by the stated contract term plus any stated options in the contract. So just because you may have a six-month lease does not exclude it per se on, on the face from uh, inclusion uh, in the financial statements under the short-term ex exception. Uh, if there is two, if there are options that extend that beyond 12 months, then you have to actually look at those option periods in determining whether or not it qualifies for that exception. Secondarily to that, once you've identified the term of the lease, you then have to assess what is the reasonably certain holding period. So this is where we're now going to look at the, the whether or not we feel confident in, in, in that we will be exercising any of those option periods that are identified in the contract. And if so, we need to be recording that contract at its reasonably certain holding period from day one. Uh, so it is a, a kind of a fine line of approach in you know, reviewing both the term and the reasonably certain holding period, but it is something that has to be required to be done and ascertained on each lease. Thanks, Tim. So now we're going to move to our first polling question. What is your greatest challenge with lease, lease accounting? Is it processes, policies, and controls? talent, staffing, and training, systems and automation, accounting complexity, embedding leasing into monthly close process. I'll give you about 10 seconds to select one of the items, please. Okay. So the results, um, pretty close between processes, policies, and controls, and systems and automation. And Dennis, what are your thoughts on this? Is this what you expected to see? It's both what I expected to see and it's, it's kind of, I'm glad to see what I see, especially in the area of processes, policies, and controls, because this isn't a one-time event. This isn't we do something on July 1st, 2020, and we're done. This is a new way of doing things going forward, so it really is going to be process change. It's going to be process improvement, and a lot of the things that you need in the systems with the systems and automation is an understanding of your policies and controls so that you can automate the, the process as well as simply automating the information that's coming out of the system. Thanks, Dennis. Tim, your thoughts on this? No, I would echo. I think the two highest percentages there uh, kind of go hand in hand. Uh, obviously, uh, as Dennis alluded to, having a sustainable process as well as the governing policies and controls, but ultimately embedding within that uh, as much automation as you can, understanding that this is a, a rather large administrative tax uh, task going forward, you know, embedding automation into that process as much as possible will alleviate the, just the administrative component of the new standard requirements. Thank you, Tim. So let's go to the second area that we're going to discuss which is policy decisions required to adopt the new standard. So how do I determine the term of a lease, Tim? Well, I think as we talked about uh, earlier, uh, you know, you have to uh, determine uh, the actual, not only the stated contractual term, but also the, uh, the embedded option periods. Uh, and you have to, uh, you know, add all of those together to determine, first of all, whether or not it meets a short-term exception. Now, uh, I can't, I've brought up the short-term exception before. I think some of those, some people may be familiar that under the, the FASB and IFRS guidelines, they do provide for some practical expedience uh, with the new standard. Unfortunately, with the GASB standard, there are no practical expedience. There is, though, uh, the, the opportunity to afford for the short-term uh, lease uh, exception. Uh, so in determining the term of the loan, just keep in mind that those option periods do deter determine whether or not you can actually exclude it for short-term lease. Even if you don't plan on using those options, if they are present in the contract, you have to contemplate them in determining whether it's a long-term lease or short-term. Thank you. Dennis, how do I determine the appropriate discount rate? So it's really a three-step process that you go through under the standard. The first 
is if the rate is provided to you in the lease. So if the funder or lessor provides a rate, you use that. If they don't, there are some rate, there are some leases where you can imply the rate. If you're given the payments and you're given the residual value and you know the original value, you can kind of back into the rate and there's software that actually will will calculate and, and imply that rate for you. And then the third way is to use your estimated incremental borrowing rate. So basically your rate that you would use to borrow that the value of that lease over that period of time is your third alternative. So it's use the rate if it's provided, use the rate if you can calculate it, otherwise you can use your, your own borrowing rates. Thank you. So Tim, what are our key takeaways for our policy decision? Well, uh, I think that uh, as we mentioned before, you know, I, correctly identifying the term of the lease, um, being able to uh, identify those leases that are short-term in nature and can be excluded from the capitalization requirement of the new Gatsby standard, and, and then you know, appropriately ascertaining the uh, reasonably certain holding periods in order to accurately reflect those leases in the financial statements. So this does require some um, level of estimation and will require likely uh, people in finance and accounting to leverage information outside of finance and accounting to make these decisions. So it will be a collaborative uh, uh, event working with either procurement or real estate groups to determine what is that reasonably likelihood of, of exercising any of those option periods in determining the correct term of the loan or the lease uh, for the capitalization component. Thanks, Tim. And Dennis, what are your key takeaways for the policy decisions? So the, the first one kind of recaps that three-step process that you go through to determine the rate. But then the second key takeaway is remembering that the rate can change over the life of the lease. If your remaining term changes, either by exercising an option, making an option reasonably certain that wasn't, or by a renegotiation, if you change the reasonable certainty of a purchase option, or if the lessor gives you a new rate, if the lessor's rate changes and they're allowed to pass that through as part of the lease, those actually require a measurement and a change in the discount rate. There are other actions over the life of a lease, like a change in payments due to CPI or a resolution of a contingency that will require a remeasurement of the remaining liability, but not require a change in the discount rate. So as with any standard, the devil's in the details, understanding all of the different ways that things can happen over the life of a lease and the impact. Thanks, Dennis. Now we're gonna to move to our third area, which is key decisions, data required to start your implementation. And Dennis, how are most entities managing the transformative scope of the new standard? So, thanks, Johnny. The first thing to realize is that you're not the first ones to go through this lease accounting change. So rely on the experience that you've seen from the public companies. Um, one important thing to understand is that the public companies that had to be effective many cases January 1st of this year, and there were private companies that were initially supposed to be effective January 1st of 2020, they've been given a one-year delay in the implementation of the standard, but the key here is the AICPA said the reason they asked for the delay is because this was more significant and complex than those companies expected. So they're giving the private companies a delay. Now, you're not getting a delay, you still have your deadlines, but just realize that the public companies found this more significant and complex, so <laughs> make sure you start early and make sure you get everyone involved in the process. Thanks. Uh, Tim, what types of data can be gathered immediately to simplify the process of adoption? Well, thanks, Joni. Uh, I think as you, when you think about the, this, this new standard, there's, there's, it's, it's a huge data gathering exercise. And, and when you think about, uh, you know, from gathering the actual physical contracts of all of the leasing arrangements that you may have, it may be uh, identifying those contracts that 
uh, are, that don't say lease on them anywhere, but inside them embedded within that contract is the right to use an asset. Obviously, gathering those documents into a central repository and, and reconciling them to whatever known lease listings that you may have will go a long way towards, uh, you know, getting yourself prepared for the journey of, of adoption. Uh, additionally, what you will find in that exercise is that you will begin to gather requirements that will be necessary for you to effectively ch choose the right accounting solution for you. Uh, if you're if you're you know diving into this exercise with uh, you know straight at the software phase without understanding the types of leases in your portfolio, then you may be uh, missing some key requirements that will be present. Should you uh, take the time and effort early on to gather the data and all of the contracts and begin to centralize them, uh, so the two key areas there being gathering the contracts and the data around those contracts and then analyzing that for potential requirements of a system that may be uh, utilized to do the accounting on an ongoing basis. Thanks, Tim. And I think that's the area that people mostly under anticipated the, the length and, the, and how long that would take as the gathering that data. So, um, Dennis, what type of internal resources are required to be involved in a typical implementation? Yeah, so an important thing to understand that this isn't just an accounting issue. Leasing touches a lot of different areas of your organization, and making sure to get them involved early will help. You'll see a topic later about what can cause an implementation to go wrong, and this kind of thing will come up again. It's making sure you get people from procurement, whoever negotiates contracts, legal, the people in the organization in operation that manage the leased assets, getting all of those people involved, as well as possibly someone from your treasury area to help you identify those in internal borrowing rates or those um, rates that you're gonna use if you're not provided a rate on the lease. So it's really thinking about everyone that currently touches a lease and making sure that they all get buy into this because this is going to be a process change going forward. You're gonna want information from them on a much quicker basis than you may have required in the past because changes to leases will change the balance sheet and you wanna know that as quickly as possible. So it's really making sure everyone from procurement to contracts to operations to IT are all involved right up front. Yes, it sounds like it could be a real uh, finance transformation with all the processes and people involved. So let's think it. Let's talk to Dennis about the key takeaways that you have for this area. Yeah. So again, the the reason for these requirements, these three key takeaways, is because, as we mentioned from the public companies, they said this was more significant and complex than they expected. So first of all, be realistic. Have a realistic timeline realize that this will take time and and that you identify your available resources you identify those periods of time when people won't be able to work on this project you have monthly or quarterly closes that you have to do you know there's times when people have other priorities so be as realistic as you can when you're setting this timeline for this project and make sure again that you involve everyone that that has an impact on this because it will affect them at the end so getting their buy-in and support at the beginning is really important. Thank you. And Tim, what are your key takeaways for the critical data area? Uh, I, I'll echo a lot, I will echo a lot of Genesis' comments. I, I think starting early uh, is, 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 is always good in, in these transformative events uh, for organizations like this. And, and more importantly, allocating the, the appropriate internal resources. Uh, so making sure that, that you've got executive sponsorship of this uh, this process uh, and and that the internal resources are dedicated to the project team throughout the life of the project. Um, I, I, nearly all of our clients are engaging implementation partners to provide resources and more importantly the experience. I think as Dennis alluded to, the uh, public companies have gone through this before. There is a roadmap to compliance uh, and, 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 and so leveraging uh, an, uh, an experienced implementation partner can gain you access to what that roadmap is. I think a lot of times people struggle with trying to put together their own roadmap, knowing 
where they are today and knowing where they need to be, but having a very difficult time filling in the, the in-between steps. Uh, an experienced implementation partner can provide that. And as I mentioned earlier, be sure to begin gathering and storing all of those known contracts and getting them into a central repository. I think you can, um, you can do this uh, for all of your existing leases, but you can also begin to incorporate a process of managing your leases that are changing on a daily basis. So uh, as new leases are entered into next week, next month, that, they, that the business knows where those should be stored uh, because this exercise of implementing is going to take several, several months. And while you're in the process of implementing, your data is going to be changing. And so, you know, putting in those that, that um, mechanism uh, internally to ensure that when these changes occur, that they're being forwarded to the appropriate people so that they get included in the implementation is another way to, um, you know, simplify the implementation. Okay, thank you, Tim. Now we're going to go to our second polling question. What are your where are you currently in your lease implementation project? Discovery, the data gathering, assessment, calculating impact, implementation, new policies, procedures, and disclosures. My project is completed. Lucky you. And looking to replace current system to one with more automation. I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Okay. Well, 84% of you are just doing your data gathering. That's pretty expected, I think. Go ahead, uh, Tim. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would like to see the 1.4% that's got it completed already. They, they obviously win the, uh, win the award for early achiever there. But you know, I would expect that most organizations are spending this time trying to discover what they have. I think that's, that's the, uh, the most challenging component is, you know, before you implement everything, you have to know everything that you have. And so uh, that discovery phase, that would be pretty indicative of where we are with the current implementation timeline. Dennis, do you have any thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, I'd echo what Tim said. Um, especially, I know a lot of uh, organization on, on here are universities, so they do have some time because the earliest most of you will have to become uh, compliant under the new standard is next July 1st. So this is an unexpected. Um, it's, it's, you're, you're early in the process, but again, part of the reason we're doing this is just to make sure you know it's, it's a challenging process. It's going to be more in depth and more more lengthy than you expect. So I'm glad to see that that people are in the data gathering uh, field. Actually, we didn't put a question on here about haven't started yet. So I don't think anyone would want to answer that anyways. <laughs> yeah, and and I think because of the full retrospective, you know, they may not be so early in the process. Right? Some years they need to get going. So. Um, Okay, so we're going to move Johnny, on. To that, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Johnny, that's a good good point. I think for those entities that are doing that discovery, please keep in mind that that discovery effort is a is a two time uh, event. You have to not only do it as of the date of adoption, but you also have to do discovery as far as your earliest period of, of financial statements presented. So um, it's not so much to understand what you have now. You also have to go back in time some, somewhat and understand what you had at that critical. Uh, date uh, for the comparative financial statements. Thanks, Tim. So we're going to move to our fourth area, which is common implementation pitfalls to avoid. Tim, in your experience, what factors have caused implementation projects to start badly? Well, and the good news here is that we, we have some relevant evidence with the public companies as it relates to, you know, what those factors are. And I, and I think I alluded to it earlier, uh, but it's, it's, it's having a roadmap uh, or a, a, a dedicated full-time project plan that outlines all of the required activities and, stream, and work streams and gets those uh, aligned with their appropriate dependencies from day one. Um, I think a lot of people kind of tackle this ad hoc and have multiple work streams going on, but there's not a lot of coordination between those work streams, nor is there a common goal that everyone is working towards. So. Uh, I think, you know, having that pre-planning, uh, having that roadmap laid out in front of you is exactly what is involved in getting from A to Z uh, early on and then setting those roles and responsibilities within your team to align, uh, you know, them on that common goal will, will get you off on the right foot on a project like this. Okay. 
And your key takeaway, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, Dennis, in your experience, what factors have caused implementation projects to get sidetracked during the project? I had this teed up and then you went right by me, but that's okay. So now we're sorry. back. <laughs> uh, I was yeah. trying to get to so the, the good part. <laughs> yeah, the, the key is during the project. I mean, Tim mentioned the, the planning and making sure you've got a set plan in place, but realize that things do happen, that resources get pulled to other things. Um, just have a plan for adjusting to those changes. But the typical things that can get projects sidetracked are, re like I said, resources, people getting pulled to other projects. Uh, a big one is what we call scope creep. So it's when you set the scope of the project, here's what we want to do. And then midway through the project, someone comes across to a process improvement that they want to make that wasn't planned or a, a new workflow or a new way to do things that can, that can derail the project. So really think think about everything beforehand, put some time in for those things that may change and get adjusted, but just realize that those things can, can cause problems during the project if there's not a good change management process in place. And then the, the final thing I mentioned, I alluded to earlier, think about blackout times. Think about periods during the month when people aren't going to be able to work on it, periods during the quarter when people aren't going to be able to work in this project, and then just plan appropriately. Thank you. And Tim, what are your key takeaways for common implementation pitfalls? Well, I think some of these are pretty straightforward for anything as transformative uh, as an event as this new standard is. But you know, obviously, identifying that executive sponsor and and setting that tone from the top as it relates to the importance of this project and why uh, you know everybody needs to be aligned on a common project plan to to succeed. Uh, you know, stay on track. I think we see sometimes that uh, we may have set maybe a finance manager or a technical accountant that may be tasked with managing the project per se, but as you can imagine, they also have day jobs. And so, uh, you know, a, a few months into the project, we find that that project management and governance is somewhat lacking. And so we do recommend that there's dedicated project management throughout the life of this project to ensure that that all of the work streams are, are working uh, together uh, to meet the common desired deadline. And then lastly, you know, start early. You know, there, there is time at this point to avoid last minute implementation risk. I think we've seen, and, and Dennis and I have both worked with clients that, that had to rush to implement in the public space. And in, inevitably what they ended up having to do was come back after they transitioned and fix everything that they had to rush in place. So having the additional time doesn't just mean that we can kick the can down the, the road. I would take advantage of that. There is nothing wrong with being ready early. Uh, in fact, if you are able to be ready early, that gives you time to test in a pilot sense some of your processes and controls. So um, stay early, stay on track, and make sure that the, the appropriate tone at the top is set. And Dennis, what, what are your key takeaways? Yeah, Joni. Actually, before I get to this, I know we're taking questions and answers at the end, but I wanted at this point to clarify something that I said that was incorrect earlier in case people weren't going to stay for the questions. Earlier, I was talking about those events on a lease that could cause a change in the rate, such as a change in the remaining term and other things. And I incorrectly stated that, for instance, a CPI change where the lease payments change or a change because of a variable rent that's been identified for that specific month, they do not cause a remeasurement. They certainly don't cause a change in the rate, but they also don't cause a remeasurement. They're simply expensed as incurred. I apologize for incorrectly stating that, and I wanted to do it now in case people aren't going to be around for questions because it's a pretty big differentiator, a pretty big difference. Um, so back on this slide, um, the first one is basically we all start to sound like our parents when we get old because they used to say this to me when I was young and I had a project to work on. And just like many of the things they said back then, it turns out to be true. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So again, it's about planning. It's about putting in all of those contingencies in your initial plan to make sure you understand it. 
It's about involving all the right people early in the project because that can really derail if you have someone that gets pulled in midway through the project and they may have different ideas about how things should work. Make sure you get that buy-in both from the top and all through the organization right at the beginning. Having these dedicated resources and finally avoiding those black ideas. So the fifth area is budget plan and staff to achieve. So what are the costs associated with the lease accounting project? And that is Dennis. Yeah, Joni. Yeah, thanks, Joni. So you've got to think about the various costs that can be involved from the beginning of the project through the end. So at the beginning of the project, you could be looking at things like assistance in developing your policy and process. This is a true process improvement process change. So you may look at, at taking resources that can help you with that, consulting for that can also include companies that can help you just discover all of your leases, finding all of the leases, looking through your systems to identify what things that you've been paying on a monthly basis and nobody ever thought was a lease, but based on the terms of the accounting standards is now sh and should be considered a lease. So it's lease discovery and then finally lease abstraction. A lot of a lot of you have your leases simply in PDFs or Word documents or or in a filing cabinet, needing to get that information, get it out, and get it into a format that will help get it into a system is another timely and, and in some cases costly endeavor. And then once you're looking at software, there's obviously the implementation cost, the one-time cost to implement the software, and then there's an ongoing cost for either a maintenance cost or a subscription for the software as well. Thanks. And Tim, can lease accounting be done by using that magical system called Excel? <laughs> well, I think if you, um, this is a loaded question because I, I, I do believe anything can be done with Excel if you hire enough people. But the challenges with the new lease accounting standard is the fact that uh, it's not a one-time calculation. So if you're thinking about, yeah, can I calculate my transition entry uh, using Excel, that's a pretty straightforward discounting. The challenge becomes with ongoing maintenance. And when you think about the nuts and bolts of the accounting behind this, every single lease that the organization has will have a separate amortization schedule associated with it that will drive the debits and credits throughout the life of that lease for that lease. And summarizing all of those debits and credits across a portfolio of hundreds of leases is very difficult to do using Excel. And then when you throw on top of it, you know, midterm modifications that require those amortizations to change, and then, uh, you know, just the complexity of trying to manage a database like that in Excel, uh, I think that you, you, you soon uh, quickly realize that your manual cost of managing this in Excel exceed the cost of actually doing it in the software. Uh, and, and there's added benefits to the software in that it, it actually provides, you know, uh, it, it's got its own SOC reporting and testing that's done on it. You can rely on the output. It's got automation in it to simplify the administration of midterm modifications and terminations, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I would say that, yes, it could be done in Excel, but I would highly not recommend that unless you've got less than a handful of leases. Okay, thank you. And Dennis, the key takeaways for this area? Yeah, so the first two are reiterating what I talked about. There's for the software, the implementation cost, as well as the ongoing software cost. And then there could also be consulting cost for the discovery, the abstraction, and the development of policy. And then the final point, I'd point you, just Google this, uh, a great article from Forbes back in 2013 called Microsoft Excel is the most dangerous software on the planet. It really talks about the use of Excel in financial markets. It talks about multi-billion dollar losses that were caused simply because Excel was used and it has no version control. It has no audit. It's way too easy to overwrite a formula with a value and not have it identifiable. So, yeah, I'd echo a lot of what Tim said on this. If, if you have a handful of leases, maybe. Um, if you have more than that, there's obvious risks to using Excel. Okay, and Tim? You know, I think a lot of times we talk, we look at, uh, you know, cost to, to, to implement software systems as, you know, um, you know the one-time cost or maybe even the subscription fees. But I would coach 
those that are evaluating uh, the use of the software to also look at what is the cost of failure. Uh, you know, making sure that it, it, while it may be a big price tag up front to get it done right, it is well worth it uh, because that cost of failure could could run, you know, as much if not more than the original implementation when you get into the cost of noncompliance, re-implementation, re-audits, everything associated with that. Secondly, I would say understand what your hidden costs are, and I kind of alluded to that in the discussion with the Microsoft Excel and that, you know, there is administrative tasks that have to be done uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to maintain a database of leases. Uh, and some softwares automate that uh, and, and, and provide a lot of automation in that administration, while some softwares provide purely an accounting calculator. Uh, in which case you will have more manual time after adoption in administering and keeping that database current than you would with the cost of another software system. So when annualizing or looking at the comparative cost between systems, uh, you, you want to add on that sustained compliance component. And, and what is it going to cost to actually operate the software and do the things? I think what you may see is there's some hidden cost out there that maybe may not be indicative with the, the one-time cost of the software that over the life of sustained compliance will greatly you know, uh, outweigh the cost of perhaps a, a more expensive software on day one. And then lastly, plan for the future. I think you, you, you need to uh, prepare for you know, an organization that is changing and growing over time. So you want to choose a solution that will grow and change with you. Uh, you'll want to choose a solution that uh, is uh, out there and available and will be out there and available 10 years from now. So a solid solution that's in the market to, to stay. So, uh, you know, you know, analyzing those costs of failure, understanding the hidden costs when you do your comparative analysis, and then making sure that you think about day one and beyond as it relates to the future of your accounting solution are three things that can help, uh, you know, budget that, that cost to achieve day one. Thanks, Tim. We're going to go to our next polling question. Which of these areas is your biggest implementation concern? Data, have we found all the leases and can we get the required data? Software, will it be implemented and work on time? People relying on manual intervention to maintain complete and accurate data and to consistently, consistently apply our accounting policies. Budget, we are having difficulty getting approval or are we going over budget? And audit, will the auditors agree with our conclusion and calculations? I'll give you just a few seconds. Okay, so data, it, it go, ties to the other one. So uh, your thoughts? Uh, Tim, on this? Uh, I, I think data is probably the biggest failure point in all of these, uh, you know, in all of the implementations that we've worked on, um, understanding and getting to that data, and then more importantly, building processes and controls to ensure that that data stays fresh over time. So I think that that's right to be a significant concern. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, you'll be well served if you spend a lot of time and, and have a lot of uh, I guess, uh, analysis related to the data component of this up front and, and make that a, a major item of, uh, you know, uh, of review as you go through uh, that will help you become successful. Dennis, any surprises on here? No, I mean, exactly what you'd expect. The biggest challenge public companies had was, was finding all of their leases. It was real easy once a year to do a contractual obligations report. It's tougher to have these on your balance sheet and know about them all. So data is obviously the biggest challenge. Okay, let's move on to our final section, um, which is considerations for ensuring day two and beyond compliance. How do different software packages differ in ongoing management of leases? Tim, I'll let you tackle that one. Yeah, I think I alluded to a lot of this in the discussion in the previous section, but I think you know, you've got um, just with car, like with cars, you've got anywhere from, and I will date myself by saying a Pinto uh, all the way to a Cadillac. But you have the same with software solutions. You'll have some that are that are purely, uh, you know, accounting calculators that will generate journal entries, but will not provide much automation as it works as it relates to the administration and ongoing maintenance of your lease database. Uh, and and then you'll have those company those software packages that have 
not only the accounting piece, but have also built out automation. And, and in some cases, they actually embed policy into the software so that the, the people that are administering the software don't even have to know the appropriate accounting policy or the appropriate debits and credits because the system is sophisticated enough to do that. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we're finding a lot of companies, you know, when, when they start looking at the day two and um, beyond, uh, really focusing on that automation as a differentiator between, you know, why I would spend a little bit more up front because I think, you know, that sustained compliance, the risk of sustained compliance is probably greater than the risk of just day one compliance. And so, you know, spending the money, the money appropriately to add that automation and to simplify the administration is, is, is the way to go, for my, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Dennis, what are the important considerations for ongoing compliance? Yeah, so first of all, I'd, I'd clarify our terminology to understand that when we're talking about day one, we're talking about the day in which you start using the new standards. So you're putting a bunch of assets and liabilities on your balance sheet. Day two is every day after that. It's a week later when a van gets damaged and that changes a lease. It's three weeks later when you renegotiate a contract. So the key is not just about becoming compliant, it's about maintaining compliance. And it's having processes and policies in place for managing those changes on leases, being able to know when things change in a timely manner, and then finding a system that helps you automate because you're either going to use an automated system or you're going to use people to do this. Okay, thank you, Dennis. And, and Tim, do you want to just share what your most important key takeaways are? Well, I think when you think about uh, day two and beyond, I think it's important to think about end-to-end. -end. We, we focus a lot of time on perhaps just the finance and accounting area, but you know, when we are building your day two and beyond uh, process maps, you have to think outside of finance and accounting and involve you know, procurement and real estate and treasury and, and the operations groups, et cetera, in developing what that end-to-end -end roadmap is going to be. And then understanding what's going, you know, what is supposed to take place when things change. Uh, so um, that means, and I'll skip over the second one and I'll go to the documentation component. So, you know, once you've identified that day two process, documenting that as well as what are the roles and responsibilities and making sure that everybody is aware of what those are go a long way towards ensuring, uh, you know, compliance in the long term. Uh, and I think the third component, which is obviously the, the, the biggest challenge for transformative events, and that is change management. Understanding that just telling people that they have to do things differently uh, will, not will not make them do that. So there, there needs to be a communication plan that, that is communicating early and often as well as a, a, a somewhat of a backup uh, review process to ascertain whether or not the change is actually being embraced by the organization. So all of the change management that's involved in a major transformation or, uh, exercise like this needs to be put in place and needs to be executed along with the implementation to ensure that the people and the processes move at the same time the technology team do. Thanks, Tim. And Dennis, your key takeaways for this last area. Yeah, so again, you can do it with a system or you can do it with people. So look for automation in any system that you're looking at. Make sure they can make bulk changes. So if you have a change that affects a number of leases, do you have to do a one by one or can you do it in a bulk process? Is there an accounting close process? This is really important because there are some systems that don't have an accounting close process. And if you make a change on a lease, in some cases it will make that change retroactively to the beginning of the lease. And then you have to do some reporting to figure out what adjusting entries you're doing. So make sure there's an accounting close process. And then finally, like, like Tim said, you can set policies in place. You can't always get them adhered to. The more that you can do within the system and automation, will make it easier because the, the system's going to obey what you want to do every time as opposed to people that have good days and bad days. Thanks, Dennis. We're going to go to our final polling question. What are you planning to do from a technology perspective? Purchase a lease accounting system, hire people to manage it in an Excel, outsource lease accounting, or unsure at this time? I'll give you a couple seconds. 
unsure at this time. Okay. Thoughts on that, Tim? I am. I'm sorry. Um, I was. I was going to jump in. I'm. I'm very impressed that we shamed everyone to not answer Excel. So that's very good. <laughs> no, I Any think uh, you know. I would just say you know if you're still gathering your data, you re you really aren't in a position to understand how you're going to manage it going forward. So this would make sense in context of where everybody is in their process. Um, you know, what we are seeing is that people typically start off thinking, maybe I can do this manually, but quickly uh, migrate to, yeah, I don't want to do that. So, um, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind as you're looking through and gathering your leases. You, you may begin to want to wanna start looking at what's out there in the gas fee market and what is available that, that you could at least have as a, a discussion point for your organization. Okay, now we're going to move on to question and answers. And um, I will start with, we only have a few minutes, and like I mentioned, if we don't get through all these, we will respond to your questions directly after, after the webinar. So let's start with this first one. Um, I'll, Tim, I'll have you answer this one. Do we still need to record a finance asset if the value of it is below our capitalization policy? No, you do have the ability to uh, ascertain materiality with GASB. So if you are, uh, if you do have a cap threshold and you're able to substantiate the asset is below that, then it would not qualify for capitalization as a finance asset under GASB 87. So uh, that is correct. You you would not uh, capitalize those. Okay. Let's go to another question. Um, will you provide examples of leases that are commonly overlooked when identifying population of leases? And I think I'm going to ask yeah, Tim that with the embedded leases, or or either one of you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know. Actually, yeah. I'm, go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say, unfortunately, yeah. This, these are the leases that nobody knows about. These are typically uh, service contracts, or perhaps, especially in the medical space. So any of the medical centers out there where perhaps a vendor is, is having you pay for a disposable, but they're giving you the machine uh, that's associated with it. You know, a lot of these contracts, placed capital contracts, zero dollar POs, et cetera, uh, you know, uh, were specifically created so that they wouldn't have to go through the capital budgeting process. So, you know, typically what we end up doing with our clients is working through a methodology of, of, of training procurement uh, on what to look for, and then scrubbing contracts that may be out there that that might meet certain criteria that would be relevant. Uh, you know, you know that, that might be indicative of a lease. You can also get there using some data analytics, but uh, I think uh, you know just having a methodology is the first thing that needs to be put in place. You know, how are you going to find them? And then uh, once you 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 have them, there is an evaluation process that has to go through. Thanks, Tim. Dennis, this one's for you. Can lessors use their incremental borrowing rate? Yeah, so from a lessor standpoint, generally you're setting the terms for the lease. So it is the, the rate that is implicit in the lease that you should be using. So okay. you don't have the challenge that lessees have where they may not be given the rates and they have to use their own. Lessors are generally in the they're setting the terms of the lease so they know the underlying rate. Okay, and uh, how about, uh, Tim, can you confirm that FASB has pushed the start date for non-public entities to January 2021? Yeah, for private entities and nonprofits, they have um, codified that extension. Uh, and those would be those that fall under FASB 842. Uh, so uh, they have pushed that. Okay. Um, Dennis, are contracts for equipment like copiers um, included? So this gets into a couple of different areas. First of all, like Tim mentioned, these are the, the kind of contracts that in some cases they may have been structured where you're quote unquote given a copier and you're expected to simply pay minimum amounts for paper and other consumables under, nor, under the past you think, well, that's just a service contract. But if you have exclusive use of that copier, if no one can walk in the door and use it other than you and you get all the present service capacity for that copier, you should be considering that copier at least. But also realize the discussion we had a moment ago about materiality. 
that you're allowed to set materiality thresholds under which lease accounting doesn't have to apply. So the answer is yes, a copier lease is a lease. Even if you're not specifically paying for the copier, you have to look at the, the underlying asset and then also you can consider materiality. Okay, I think that's, we're gonna, we're gonna follow up with all the questions that weren't answered so we can just wrap this up and make sure we end on time. So uh, we want to offer everyone on the call to sign up for our free on-site workshop. All the companies that we've done this for have found this very valuable. Um, you'll walk away with the understanding of how the implementation of the standard will impact your existing policies, procedures, systems, and disclosures related to leases. Um, so you'll see the significant impacts of the standard developing a timeline to implement the new standard developing a project plan, technology considerations. We'll bring Lease Accelerator with us to do the demo and anticipating implementation challenges. So if you're interested in that, you need to contact us at partner at RGP, think really good people, healthcare.com. And to end, we just want to remind you that um, you, uh, the CP that I talked about at the beginning, don't forget to, uh, if you need the CPA accounting credit, don't forget to um, have answered your polling questions if you qualify. And um, there's an, and we'd love to get your evaluation form, um, which you will see uh, on the here to do, like we mentioned earlier. So. Um, we really appreciate your feedback. So when we host future events, I know a question was if we were going to host future events, we will be hosting future events. Um, and so stay tuned for those. And with that, thank you all for attending and good luck with your uh, lease compliance effort.